Welcome to episode 19 of the Global Conversations webcast. My God, where is time gone in terms of this? And today, my guests and I will speak about the future of entrepreneurship and what that looks like for racialized and marginalized folks. In the faces, if the faces of two of my guests look familiar to you, well, you're right. From now, what she told me, I originally thought it was sunny, Santa Monica, but it's today it's raining, she says. <laughs> She's wearing uh, the sunny on her sweater. She's wearing right? the sun. That's sweater. right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, Jenny Vasquez Newsom is the founder and CEO of Untap Leaders and the author of Untap Leadership: Harnessing the Power of Untap Le Untap Leadership. Um, she was my guest on episode one of season two. So, Jenny, again, welcome. Thank you. And then, of course, and then, of course, there is Angela, <laughs> hailing from both of uh, both of us. Sunny Chicago. Well, I'm in Toronto. She's in Chicago. The founder and CEO of Call for Culture, a former chief people officer and former podcast host of Social Responsibility for Work. You'll hear us constantly talking about us being Virgos on both yeah. the, on both her oh, podcast and and uh, and of course on my mm -hmm. podcast before. So, uh, so if you want to check out Angela, she was on episode four of season two. So again, Angela, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. No problem. So as I mentioned, um, not only was I on Angela's uh, podcast, but I was also on Jenny's podcast uh, last, both of them at the end of 2022. And then of course, Jenny 2023. And it was high time to have both of them on my webcast as return guests because they're both amazing. I just, just have to say that. And they have so much to say about organizational change, leadership, and of course, being entrepreneurs as the, as the, as the, you know, as the nature of this uh, webcast itself. So thanks again for, for both of you. So let's get started here. And I want to uh, have a little bit of fun. So outside of what we've talked about, uh, it's customary for my guests to speak about the one thing that is unique about them that no one knows. So Angela, I want to put it to you. Look at Jenny. She's like, I need oh, more time. I I need more. Come on, that's like nothing. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I'm gonna throw it out to the both of you. That nobody knows. That nobody knows. Nobody knows. Oh nobody knows, or maybe, or maybe your 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 husband knows. That's about okay. it. Okay, I was gonna say, like, my husband knows everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> what does nobody know about me? Okay, so fun facts. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a paleontologist. I oh, would geez. go on fossil digs. I would collect fossils. I was the nerdiest person. I still am. I'm still a huge nerd. But I think about like, how was that work linked to the work I do now, right? Because you, you have to go back to childhood and be like, yeah, what was the one thing you wanted to do? And, you know, a lot of what we do is like paleontology and anthropology. We're studying ecosystems and societies yep. and we're, we're unearthing things and making inferences about the future and evolution. So I think it's linked, but yeah, not a lot of people know that about me. And I still have like random fossils and gems and stones and just a nerdy, nerdy hobby of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny? That's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Now I have a, I mean, I was trying to think, but then I got I tried engrossed to in long. your, <laughs> when I was so into Come the on. paleontology story. <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, well, Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say. I'm going to go with like a silly one that maybe folks don't know broadly. Um, mm -hmm. That one food that I don't like that a lot of people like is rice. I don't eat rice. I don't know what this stems from. Um, I am Cuban, so there's a lot of rice eating. Uh, I was just going to say I that. I think I overdid it as a kid because mm. now anything, my husband laughs, I, you know, anything with rice in it, I just put it to the side because I, I don't consume it. So that's a mm. random, random fact um, to throw out there, but now listeners will know. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's something that came out of nowhere. <laughs> I, you, you asked, okay? Hey, I asked, and that's what it is. That's what we expect. So no one knows. So next time, if I'm ever in LA, or when I'm in LA, or when the three of us are together, guaranteed, we're not going to get anything that's rice related. That's or right. we can, but you just won't eat it. I won't be there. What yeah. about cauliflower rice? Like, yeah. you know, 
you know, you're pushing it a little bit like that. <laughs> okay. <It's> so <laughs> <laughs> oh my spare, God. Spare. <laughs> Come on, cauliflower rice. Well, I mean, I don't know. Why well, do you like? Okay, do you like cauliflower? I like cauliflower. Yeah. So what's wrong with cauliflower rice? Or is it just the image of rice as a whole? Just its purpose. It's like it just overtakes any meal that I just don't. But I understand the value and the, the you know just why it is a food of the world. Like if you think about all cultures, a lot of different cultures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. are based on a kind of a grain or a rice. Um, so it is, I, I see the value just for me personally. I, I think I ate too much of it. But so basically <laughs> no, so it's going to say, so basically no Visayas, no, uh, no sushi restaurants, nothing. You know, I mean, I'll do, the, okay. See, so we're really getting into the weeds here. <laughs> yeah, I really triggered hey, hey, something hey, with hey, you guys. Is, I really is, triggered it. This is why it's fun. So yeah, go. <laughs> No, I'll definitely, I'll always do for acai. I mean, I always do the Cuban food for sure, but yeah. I don't do the rice based. I'll, I'll skip the rice or uh, frijole and, and the rice. Yeah. I'll just do the frijoles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we know. <laughs> now we know. Anyway, so <laughs> so that was a good start to, to, to the conversation. Now let's get, well, I don't know if it's serious because eventually it'll get fun, but so let's talk about your journeys to entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, Jenny, I think I want to start with you being the former, for, I wouldn't say former, I guess you're kind of still that academic, so to speak. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so tell us about Untapped Leaders, un, Untapped Leadership and, and all of that. Yeah, so, you know, I think my journey into entrepreneurship um, late stage, quote unquote, who, and who knows mm-hmm. what um, stages are these days. But I, you know, I spent a couple decades working within systems. I have a background in higher ed. I also worked in nonprofits um, right before founding Untap Leaders. I was the VP of training and programs at a civic leadership institute. So really kind of working um, in positions within organizations that are already established, you know, kind of in that traditional mm-hmm. sense. And so the like entrepreneurial road was never um, in my line of sight along those ways. Even though now looking backwards, I always had a bit of that entrepreneurial spirit spirit in even in those positions. They always were kind of the first in that role or building something from scratch or really kind of in that early stage of, of the work. So that entrepreneurial drive was there, even though the like, the how was a little different. And so for me, you know, uh, 2020 was the year that like shifted a whole bunch of stuff um, and really um, had me reflecting on my career, you know, how I want to utilize my time and my talent um, where I thought uh, I could have more impact. uh, And, and that's where it really kind of, <laughs> the light turned on. It's like, oh, I have to, I have to go out on my own. Um, I have to, I have to do, I have to build something new, new uh, to to do this work. And so that's where, uh, you know, the Untapped Leadership book started uh, being written, and then ultimately founded the organization to to operationalize the work. Um, and so again, you know, Untapped Leaders really centers marginalized perspectives in leadership development because traditionally those. Uh, spaces and, and you know, uh, frameworks are led by those that don't look like any of us here on this call. Um, uh, so yeah. that's that's really what the, the purpose is. So, so yeah, so a few decades in to my, you know, career, uh, I think that's when the, the light bulb went off. Yeah. Angela, what about you? You know, I mean, call for culture is the thing for you. So, uh, so how, so for everyone watching and listening, how did, it get all, how did it all get started for you? Oof, well, I started building this business about a decade ago. I was similar to Jenny in that I was this entrepreneur for most of my career. I always was leaning towards building, designing. And there was a point where I started to actually coach women, women of color in leadership in particular, Um, you know, I was in the process of getting my organizational psychology degree, like, what can I do as I'm working full-time in corporate America to, you know, start 
doing things on my own, going out on my own. And um, I was thankful to a, a friend. Her name is, is Lauren. She's the CEO of a company called Career Contessa. And she reached out and said, hey, do you want to do some career coaching? And that was like my first like light bulb of like, oh, I can make money on my own doing something like this. And I tried it and I coached um, lots of women, uh, lots of women of color. And what I found was that I was getting them after they had been exposed to a toxic system. So I was coaching them through navigating that system, how to get out of it, how to cope, you know, what they should do next. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I I need to create something to help solve the root cause issue. So after I graduated with my industrial organizational psychology degree, um, I basically rose the ranks, you know, went through the, the whole, you know, being the corporate titan, right? The person who's like, you know, the high potential, the um, giving 125%. Um, and my last role was as a chief people officer. So I kind of reached the ranks, as they say, you know, I, I reached mm-hmm. the executive level and I was burnt out. I was burnt out. I helped an organization get through COVID and then I was done. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I took kind of the, the seven to 10 years of experience I had with building organizations, building teams. And I realized I had a methodology that I was using and I didn't even know it. And so yeah. once I saw the patterns, I started to build what is now the business call for culture. Um, and we use yeah. a multidisciplinary approach to culture transformation and change. Um, so yeah, here we are. <laughs> well, here we are. So there's always a reason and rationale for entrepreneurs to to do the work that they do. And whether it is, you know, untapped leaders of racialized and marginalized communities, same thing with you, Angela, you know, given the fact of the toxicity that exists mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, the fact that, you know, we're all burnt out in doing this work. And, uh, you know, I can even speak from experience uh, with respect to burnout. And, you know, I don't want to take anything away from what you what you two have mentioned here. But I want to focus solely on, you know, the women entrepreneurs of color here, especially now as we're taping or as we're recording, it is Women's International Women's History Month and, of course, International Women's Day next Friday. So, you know, reflecting on... Uh, something I found out through the World Economic Forum of recently, it's been noted that women entrepreneurs, uh, particularly those of color, contribute significantly to innovation and resilience in the business landscape, which which you both have mentioned. So can you, so I guess you've kind of mentioned this briefly about your pivotal moment of uh, the innovation uh, that you've, that you landed upon, if you will. Um, so Speak more about that uh, that case, about your methodology, if you will, and how that spearheaded uh, your work in your domain. And secondly, and to the both of you as well, how did you perceive that impact on fostering a more inclusive and resilient entrepreneurial ecosystem? So, Angela? Yeah, yeah, happy to, to jump in. Um, you know, I think women and women of color especially, um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about like this, the state of women who are leaving the work, leaving the workforce um, to start their own um, venture. The numbers are staggering. I mean, I don't know if, if any, you know, if folks have kept up on, I guess, you know, the unemployment statistics and what's happened with women since COVID, um, you know, the system broke down for us, basically, mm-hmm. right? We knew it was broken already but it it completely broke down for women and especially women of color. So there was an article that came out, I might be happy to send the links, but there was a Fast Company article that came out um, and then the Harris Harris poll uh, noted that 200,000 black and Latin women have disappeared or vanished from the workforce since the beginning Mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I hate those two words vanished and disappeared because we didn't disappear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, we decided to start our own thing to create systems and structures that um, work for everybody. Um, But that is a, that is a huge insight that we're just not talking about. Women literally said, women of color in particular literally said, this isn't working. I'm going to create my own thing. And I think Mm -hmm. that's really, really powerful. And we're starting to see the power in numbers around that. 
um, you know, folks like Jenny and I who are creating, um, who are writing books, who are getting more representation um, in publications, who are creating firms that are, you know, honestly competing with like the McKinsey's of the world and these big like top four firms that Honestly, I, I think people are going to start to gear themselves toward more social enterprises, social impact driven organizations, mm -hmm. and hopefully moving away from these organizations that have existed and haven't done much around transforming the paradigms that need to be transformed. So I think that's one thing. There's like this power in numbers, and I, I think we're going to take over the world, obviously. Um, but also, you know, our approach is really focused on hearing all voices in the process. So a cornerstone of our approach is bringing in the idea of inclusivity when it comes to culture change. A lot of other organizations are very focused on that executive level, which we know what right. that executive level looks like, right? It is not a mm -hmm. representation of the workforce. And so right. um, one of the things that we have implemented and has come from my experience and my life experience is that you have to include all the voices in the process um, and hold the leaders accountable. Um, so that's a, the second piece. And also, I think there are consulting firms out there who will not hold leaders accountable. You know, they'll present yeah. a deck, let them know what the results are and, you know, not say the thing that needs to be said. So we consider ourselves truth tellers in the process. Um, so that was a lot. Um, so, Jenny, I'm going to announce it to you to get yeah. your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, especially when it comes to social impact, like what you said, you know, I want to hear your, your thoughts about the social impact aspect and how that's mm -hmm. influenced you and your work. Yeah, I mean, so to really underline what you said, Angela, and that was something that, you know, it was, I knew we would talk about is just the propensity at which, you know, women of color are choosing to exit systems, these organizational systems that have not supported them. Um, I think the one piece I would also add to that conversation is uh, that it, I struggle with the scenarios and I've, I've seen them where women feel like they have no choice but mm. to then start something, to start consulting, to start like something outside of systems. And, that's to say that, you know, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Um, it's not, you know, uh, of interest for everyone or skill set. Like, it's just really now these situations forcing um, women of color often to just go a path that they might not have wanted to do aside from just being in toxic workplaces or workplaces where they're kind of navigating biases, trying to get to equal footing with, with everyone else. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the social impact piece is essential, is core to untap leaders um, and the work that I'm trying to do because, uh, and I think maybe Angela, you, this will resonate, you know, we can see the brokenness of, you know, the systems. Like we can, we've experienced it, we've yes. witnessed it. So we're in now in this position to, work against it or to to solve for it. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, the, the stat around, um, you know, women are kind of doing more, uh, bringing in and folding in more social impact efforts within the organizations mm -hmm. or within whatever they're starting. I would say it's because they see just that, that same standpoint of uh, seeing how systems have failed us um, no matter what industry you're in or where, you know, what you do, I mean, it's across the board, uh, the, the limited access to opportunities that, that there are. And so I, I feel like, you know, women um, and women of color especially are embedding that social impact piece to their organizations because it, it is in direct response to the challenges that they've experienced. And again, we're, we're the only ones to do it. And I think that's where like the value really comes in is that that's our, um, that's our like uh, competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Sorry, bros. Like we, we got this because we can see it much more clearly. And so that's where, you know, I think the, um, it just goes hand in hand, the, that social impact and business piece. It just, it yeah. can never be separated. I, I, I believe for, for folks like us. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, as entrepreneurs, we always want to make a profit here, but there's also the social Olympic. And of course, then with larger corporations, they're less about the social Olympic or they say will be part of the social impact. But yet at the end of the day, that is something that is not practiced. They don't practice what they preach. Right. So that's why, that's why many of us do this work is because of the fact that we've seen it all. We've heard it all. And we're tired of it because of the fact that you're not helping who you, um, you know, who you want, what, what values you want to embed into an organization and what they should be doing. So then, you know, take, take me through, and I know this is something we didn't really talk about much, but take me through an or something that would have, what you would mention to these organizations in terms of, all right, we've seen it. You're not doing anything about it. How do we, you know, how do you, how do you change that? How do you change that mentality? So what, what have you done as entrepreneurs to, to help uh, assist leaders who are not in that headspace of wanting to make that change and, and whatnot to either of you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll mention a few things. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing this work for a while. I've been doing this work personally for a while. We've been doing this work yeah. collectively as call for culture for a bit of time. Um, the amount of pl like playing a game that people don't have the instructions to that happens in organizations is startling. Um, yeah. And it is a, a huge blind spot for people who know the game. And because they just know the game, the game is the game and they've been playing yeah. it for generations. And so when people don't know how to play the game, um, you know, you get branded as, you know, not being with it or not performing, troublemaker. Or not it, troublemaker. Um, yeah. Yep. So that is devastating for people who, again, the system was not built for. And yeah. I see it every time we do culture assessment with organizations. There's there's a little bit of that. There's a there's a lot of leadership, and you know how leadership is functioning collectively to role model the type of behaviors the organization says that they want to see permeated. Um, I think there's also a lot of in groups and out groups, yeah. and that goes back to that. You know, if you're playing the game right conversation, right? People who are playing the game right are in the in-group. The people who aren't are in the out-group. And that gets perpetuated over and over and over again. And people wonder why, you know, people of color are leaving the organization because they've yeah. brought the diversity in, but they haven't created the inclusive environment and they haven't dismantled the games that have existed. Yeah. Yeah. Jenny. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> That's all she needs to say. Next question. Next question. That's all she needs to say. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. I mean, I think, you know, from my lane and, and my lens, you know, it really is zeroing in on the leadership piece because that is where power sits, power has been given. Um, the game is designed, is played, is changed, the rules, you know, all, all, all happens at that leadership level. And a lot of what you're kind of naming, Angela, really um, originates from these eras of exclusion, like true exclusion mm -hmm. in workplaces that are then designing in and out groups really based on a game, but also, again, based on a, you know, typically white and male mm -hmm. game that was purposeful to create so that that again we we, we hold power within a certain few mm -hmm. with a, you know in, in leadership and so um i you know I, I this work is tricky angela like i know i, I know you know it cuz you know so i come yeah. in with a kind of the leadership lens and i think my way that I play the game is uh, a bit more on stealth mode. I talk about this in the book a little bit of, of like mm -hmm. really operating in stealth mode so that um, folks don't realize maybe what we're, we're trying to do here when we talk about effective leadership, when we talk about kind of contextual agility that is required to be an effective leader. What I do with, you know, organizations and with, with teams and, and, and groups is to do leadership development in a way that embedded in it is 
all the marginalized perspectives that they have right. left out, that they, you know, have not even considered, not even aware of, even for ourselves as leaders of color, um, that we don't, we don't realize, but we check at the door in order to just kind of navigate and thrive in systems. And so um, my stealth mode approach is really under this cover of this is effective leadership. To be effective as a leader, you have to be grounded in context and you have to be agile in that context. And you have to know that everyone's context in this space is going to be different. Um, and so yeah. how do we, you know, build frameworks and tools and strategies with that baseline uh, so that then, then we don't have to, you know, I mean, Angela, I don't want to put you out of work, but like, we don't have to call on Angela to no. fix all the messes, you know? <laughs> no, and that's what it is. And, you know, I want to even speak to about the fact that both, both of you are women, women of color, right? So there's going to be challenges here to, to fighting these systems because of the, the rampant sexism, the rampant racism, the rampant discrimination, biases, et cetera. And, you know, I can only speak as a, as a male, yes, biracial, whatnot. But, you know, one of the things too, doing this work is, is that as an entrepreneur is that there's financial challenges in all this, right? And I know, Angela, you and I have spoken about this, uh, you know, you know, in confidence. And I, believe, I think I'm pretty sure, Jenny, you, you've you've expressed it in, you know, in, in, in posts and stuff like that. So, you know, to the both of you, you know, given the fact that we've we've seen an uptick in in uh, in female led entrepreneurship, especially from women of color, um, financial barriers remain a significant hurdle in all of this. So yeah. and we know that financial backing of people, especially on the tech side, is even that much less uh, in terms of that. So I guess for the people that are watching and listening, I want to, I want to, I want to hear from you about your, your significant challenges and what, you know, have, you know, have there been times that you've decided, uh, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go back to the, to the, to the, you know, to the working world or, you know, what are the things that has kind of said to you, look, I'm going to stick through this. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I want to do. How how have you got overcome those those challenges, if you will, as entrepreneurs, especially women of color? Oof, well, I'm feeling this in a big way right now. So yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> All right, talk about it. Let's go. Let's go, Edge. Let's go. So when I started my business, nobody told me. <laughs> nobody told me <laughs> that you can that you can raise money, that you can find grants, that you can yeah. like my mindset was so limited. It was like, I make money, I spend it. That's what I've been taught my entire life, right? You yeah. have a budget, you make money, you spend it, you manage to the budget. There are white boys out here raising millions and millions of dollars for ideas, not products, yeah. ideas, Na on napkins. Okay. Say, yeah. Hey, this is my idea. Will you back me? And they're getting the money like this snap of a finger and here i am like oh let me budget my balance sheet and what needs you know like it was a whole mindset thing that i had to yeah. unlock very intentionally and when i unlocked it because thankfully i was surrounded by a community of people uh, especially women who are like do something different um mm. so thankfully i i intentionally surrounded myself with really good people who who knew how to play the game and um but I wouldn't have known otherwise. Nobody in my family is an entrepreneur. Nobody built a business. Everybody had, you know, uh, basic jobs. Um, my dad get, didn't get past, past eighth grade, worked a manufacturing job. My mom got her degree right after I got mine. Um, so nobody told me this was an option. And not, no. to, not to their fault, but this is a generational, this is a generational um, um game that has been played and our if you think about our generational and our ancestors right we have a huge gap in wealth and business ownership so that is off the bat was a challenge and then you know um i finally hired a cfo on my team to help educate me on the financials and that that's been game changing and to open up options for us uh, but I will tell you, you know, um, people 
have trouble investing in this sustainability work and this culture work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People will throw down millions of dollars on the customer journey and the marketing journey and marketing tools, but they will penny pinch when it comes to um, value, you know, things that bring their values to life, um, yeah. leadership development. And so that's been, I'm, I'm definitely feeling all the backlash that we've been hearing about yeah. from a DEI perspective. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I've jumped, I've kicked off this year and we're not doing as well as we thought we would. Mm -hmm. um, and that is hard. That is hard to, you know, kind of have this outlook and then, you know, everyone starts to scale back. But what we are finding is the people who are working with us are committed and are doubling down. So that's yeah. a really positive thing. Yeah. Jenny, what are your, what are your thoughts on all this? What's your experience actually now? Yeah. You know, um, so untapped leaders is almost two years old. Um, so young business, uh, and it's me and, you know, contract support. And, and that's really the extent to which, you know, I can afford in this building stage. And, you know, that, that conversation or that piece around like finding, funding and, and like, you know, uh, different sources to you know, support rather than just kind of the revenue, the traditional revenue uh, generating uh, avenues that I've taken. Um, I always pause because it, I, so I'll, I'll be frank and open. I, you know, I value money. I value livelihood. I also value my time and energy. And I don't know, I, I've always kind of hesitated on kind of getting some of that like um, investment support or, you know, it's anywhere where I have to now bring in a stakeholder that then has um, thoughts on how I should run the business or how I should operate. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I actually am okay without that, uh, you know, in a way. And so I've always kind of taken the approach of, I will stay small as long as that, like I'll take the, the slow road. Um, I'll stay very small um, for as long as needed uh, and, you know, build systems to then uh, save the money or like it really kind of just be internal. I mean, a little bit, I think where, yeah. where you were, Angela, um, again, a few years ago uh, and, and thinking about that in that way, because I haven't mm -hmm. yet, let go of, or I fear this, like uh, letting go of the value of how I want to do the work um, that, you yeah. know, I work on a four day work week. I made an exception today to join you all for a conversation on Friday. I'm excited, <laughs> but like, it's, it's, I'm, this is going to be what if, if, and when untapped leaders grows, it will be a different type of business, um, you know, and, and I sometimes wonder that, you know, I think that like the VCs and the, all, all the spaces that are doing this are kind of in a, still a paradigm that, that um, may not initially align uh, with, with the vision. So I don't know if that answers, but it's hard all to say that, you know, it's not no. entrepreneurship. Again, it's like month to month situation. No. Um, that's, that's where you operate. It's, it's emotional, right? That's what it really boils down to is, you know, yes, there's a financial part, but there's also the emotions of it, you know, wanting to drive change, wanting to, you know, have that social impact, wanting to build future leaders, uh, especially from racialized and marginalized people. So, you know, all this aside, you know, where the statistics are pretty much negative with this respect, mm -hmm. however, it's portrayed in the media, um, you know, and whatnot. And, and so getting back to who you are, who you are as individuals, how is that, how is that identity of who you are shapes or influence you down your, down your career path? And what, you know, when someone is asking you who is black, Hispanic, South Asian, whatever, and saying it's hard in these streets, what has, what has driven you? to to move forward so i you know jenny start start with yeah. that one i think you know my lived experience my identity uh that has been core and central to 
the work. Um, it has been the play, the, my you know stable foot in in the work that I do, and I say, and in the really kind of the ethos of the approach with untapped leadership, it, and something that you know I think took decades to understand what uh, what is actually untapped is that those perspectives, those lived experiences, the struggle, the like navigating all the elements of this work are actually assets and resources to pull from yeah. in the journey. And, and that's really what I work with, you know, uh, BIPOC leaders in particular, but full teams as well of like, you know, how do we harness all the aspects of ourselves that we muted or shelved or pushed aside? Um, because in in those elements, we have our unique uh, offer, our unique perspective, what we can give and bring to anywhere that we are. Um, and we also then operate in much more alignment um, and it's much more fulfilling. And we're not like, you know, code switching and, and compartmentalizing and doing this work that then kind of is peels away at our humanness. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think... I really get behind the, that I could only think about it in this way because of my identity as a woman of color in leadership, mm -hmm. navigating, um, trying to make it all fit for me as, as I've done. Um, that's really where the, the insights have lied. Um, the one thing I'll add though is it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this space now and I, Angela, I'd be interested to hear your reflections on this where I now want to take myself out of the work um, a little bit. Like, you know, when it is so it's fueled and created from identity, from experience, then it's very personal. <laughs> it's yeah. like very, it's that connection is very yeah. strong. So then how do I now like move beyond and away so that it lives and it is its own thing. And that's like the, you know, this what the goals for 2024, 2025 is to like keep doing that so that it's not, um, I'd, I'd love to get myself out of it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. 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 Angela, what about you? Yeah, no, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying, Jenny. You know, I am a uh, biracial woman and, you know, I also recognize that I have privilege right? It's, it's such an yep. interesting um, balance to balance privilege and oppression at the same time. And so I think discovering what that means at this stage of life, especially as an entrepreneur, and recognizing the privilege that I have and using it to uplift and elevate mm. other people is something that like this second half of my life, you know, I, I've I've realized I'm now, you know, middle aged, uh, you know, per the new life expect expectancy awesome. number. So well, yeah, okay, whatever. Middle age, please, please stop. First of all, I'm older than the both of you. Okay, so let's just stop right there. Okay, middle age, my anyway. Go on, please. I knew I was going to get him. I knew it. We got him. Oh, got so you him. did this on purpose? Oh, okay. All right, all right. All right, Angela. All right. I see where you're going. All right, go, so go. I, I, have, I am now middle-aged. And Lies. I want to use the second half of my life to elevate voices and to, to Jenny's point, you know, kind of step, take a step back and, you know, realize that part of leadership is also you know, making sure that you're, you know, ringing in the next generation of leadership. So that's really important to me. But also, I think, bringing my lived experience of, you know, being an other, right. Mm -hmm. And so that like the, the oppression side of my identity, which is recognizing that and realizing that that shapes, that has shaped my entire working career. And it's now going to shape how I incorporate this into this work. Also yeah. being able to say, you know, and to step back and to say, you can't speak for all POC lived experiences. You know, unfortunately yeah. we've kind of like grouped everybody together, right? And we're like, oh, POC. Yeah. And so I get asked to speak about so many things that I'm just like, yeah. this is, I, I, I can't speak to this, but I know someone who can. Um, and 
providing opportunities for people. So one of the things that we've done is, you know, we've created a speakers network at Call for Culture because I didn't want to speak on all the things, nor should I. Yeah, well, that's what it is. That's what it is, right? I, you know, a lot of us, because we're lumped into that group, which to me, and then Jenny, I know you mentioned it, but I cannot stand the mm-hmm. use of BIPOC, right? And I know what it's- What would you it's say? Oh, you global majority. That's global you're majority saying. is me, right? Yeah. Because, because if, well, number one, well, actually if that stems from the fact that we in Canada, we're described as visible minorities, right? Mm. But it's like number, you know, let's look at the context of North America in that we're going to be the majority minority, if you will. So Mm -hmm. get rid of that minority concept because there's a lot of interracial mixing when it comes to to marriage and relationships, et cetera, and new immigrants, new immigrants coming into both of our countries. And given the fact that we're going to overtake you know, white people in white European people in this country, that's, it's time that we start talking about. And of course, from a global perspective too, in that South Asian Chinese obviously are make up, and of course, African nations make up the largest components of our population, right? So why are we still going to be called minorities, right? So the tra- the, tra- the the trajectory is there. That's why I say global majority and I move away from even, even, you know, as much as I, we did talk about people of color. Yeah. Like I, you know, we are global majority. This is who we are now. So it's time for us to reckon time for people who are holding the power to let go of that power and start realizing that we are the people that are, are, that are moving this, this nation and this world. And, and definitely, and that's it. And, and, you know, and I, you know, and I commend you to especially in doing this work and and going and going forward with it and i you know and i appreciate it and you know and one thing that that resonated with me to jenny well first it was jenny and then angela too was the fact that sometimes we take a lot of this personally Mm -hmm. right because of the fact of how we've been wronged in our organizations and how we've been, and 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 how we've had to, as as both of you mentioned, play the game, right? And it gets tiring. We get burnt out, right? And so that's where we have to change the narrative as global maturity leaders in doing this work. No matter if you are a you know a management consultant, an organizational change consultant, um, you know whatever it is, is that the time has come for all of us and it's time for all of us to, um, you know, to be included in the conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what both of them, I mean, I'm not even saying, I think, I know that's what the both of you are are trying to achieve. And yes, Mm -hmm. it is, it is a struggle in these streets as, as, as the kids say, and I'm talking to you, Angela. Um, (laughs) Never forget. I'm, I'm ahead That's out. right. Ahead <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, as you know, it's 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 a struggle in these streets, and uh, and yeah, but we have to continue moving forward, right? And that's that's the bottom line with all this work mm-hmm. because we're passionate about it, but we need to take step back for ourselves because I know I have felt the stress of like being on. 24 seven and never really giving myself a break from that. And it's, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. And it's good for you, Jenny, to say, although you did sacrifice today, that you have that. It wasn't a sacrifice. It was, it okay, was willing. <laughs> okay. Willing. Okay. Fine. I mean, because it's, because it's us, that's all it is. And that's right? it. That's a hundred percent. it. Yeah, you know, exactly. Because it's us. If it's anyone else, it's like, no, ah, no. whatever. Anyway, <laughs> but I mean, you know, for the both of us, it's, it's, for the three of us, I should say, it, all of us, it's it's about giving space for ourselves to 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 provide that opportunity to relax, to you know, just to be ourselves and just to you know mm-hmm. be with our families and stuff like that. So definitely, that's the conversation we need to continue to have, and actually for entrepreneurs to mm-hmm. to think about that it's okay 
to take a step back. It's okay that there's a day that you don't make money, right? It's not the end of the world because you need to give your give yourself space. Am I right or wrong here? That's right. It's a long game. Yeah. It's a long yeah. game. And I, I, you know, I, I always think like the energy that you have to give to building something new, it's a different type of energy, you know, uh, it, it's yeah. a, the energy to give, you know, to like react and respond to some of these systems. These like really centuries old things that are happening that we are trying to like yeah. make head roads in. That's a lot of energy. And so if we think about the long game, our sustainability, how do we make sure we can stay in it um, and keep playing for, for the long run? Um, that's what I think about. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So with that, I know we had a, you know, it was a, it was a fun last little bit of this episode. And, and, you know, yes, it was a little dour at the beginning, but all with Angela and her jive at me or jab at me, you know, um, at the end of the day, I got her back. So there we go. Anyway, <laughs> that's how we play. That's, right. that, that's how Virgo we play. Energy, I'm telling you. I, know, I was like, I'm a cancer. Yeah, I was I like, ooh, I'm just going to stay out of this. <laughs> I'm going to be looking, but. <laughs> that's the this. energy we, we, the three of us have, right? So, <laughs> and you know, that's all it is. And so I want to close off with a little bit more fun here. Uh, fun and a little bit seriousness. So what is the one song, as Angela's wiping her tears, <laughs> what is the one song that that gets you going every day or that inspires you to move on, move forward? So um, I know Angela's thinking, so Jenny, go. You know what? I always, and these questions, I always pop up my Spotify and so like, okay, what's been in like, yo, heavy yo, yo, rotation yo. recently? I, um, so I'm going to put, I, rec I recommend a song called No Confusion by the Ezra Collective and the vibe is right. The beat is right. And it's about like, you know, I'm here. There, there shouldn't be any confusion. I am here and I'm clear with what I need to do. Uh, and so the, the message is also good. So I'll put that one on your playlist. All right. Ooh. Angela. Uh, I'm doing the same thing. I'm like looking through. I mean, I've got Megan Thee Stallion on here. I don't know if I should recommend any of those songs, oh, but um, so, okay, here's one. Um, so this was a song. If anyone is a Daddy Yankee fan and a Janet Jackson fan, they made a song together. Did you know this? Oh, my. No, I did I not know this until recently. It's, no. called Ma it's called Made for Now, which I think is very appropriate mm -hmm. to our conversation. Mm -hmm. So add that one to your playlist. There we go. It's a jam. There we go. There you go. That's that's the jams. Mm -hmm. So we end our we end our our I don't even want to call it a conversation. I don't know what to call it. It's just it's just it's just <laughs> us. Yeah. It's just us, right? It's just how Aww. we how we jam, right? Or as the kids <laughs> do it now, right? The hard is it different? I know. I, I, Did you know? Is this, yeah, is this... <laughs> they're doing they're doing this now? <laughs> what Gross. the heck is this? So is that is that the new IWD thing too? Like the little That's I know the heart thing, yes, but now the where the fingers are positioned. No, I, if you're watching this, you will see this, and you'll you'll either you'll shake your head and or it's like, yeah, this is what I need to do. But no, it's okay, it's okay. We 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 do our thing. So, <laughs> um, oh man. I don't know. We could all, you know, we could go forever on this, but I, I you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get this into a, I mean, it could be a comedy show at the end of the day. <laughs> we could, we could, we could definitely get on stage and, and just do some, do something. But anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's close it off. And so I want to say thank you again to the both of you for being who you are, right? It's not just being my guests, but being who you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I want to say that over the last, the last two years, I've gotten to know the both of you. Yes, social media, we are miles apart from each other. But, you know, whether you've posted something on social media or we've had these one-off conversations in the past, I'm so grateful to having the both of you in my lives. And I'm, you know, and I learn from you every day. And, and you know, and I'm, and I can call you my my friends, and hopefully one day the three of us will, will be in one city together and we can, mm. you know, just just yuck it up over drinks, over dinner, 
um, hanging out on the beach, whatever it is. And I, you know, I'm looking forward to that day when it happens. So, so thank you to the both of you. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andre. Same, same. Yeah, definitely. So where can people find you in the, in the, in these, in this, uh, social world of ours, Angela? Uh, so yeah. Check us out at callforculture.com or you can find us on Instagram. I'm under Angela R. Howard CFC or uh, at Call for Culture. Right. And Jenny? Yep, untappedleaders.com and at untappedleaders on LinkedIn and Instagram. And then I'm under, under Jenny Vasquez Newsom. I make folks write out the whole name, uh, mm -hmm. two Zs uh, on LinkedIn and Instagram. All right. Well, thanks again, ladies, for this wonderful conversation. I'm pretty sure everyone will, I actually, they will share it. They will subscribe and they will both, they will follow you both uh, in the future and learn from you. And, and, you know, if that gets you more business, great. If they want to just reach out to you in terms of any advice guaranteed, but, you know, to all the success to the both of you and I, and I'm, you know, I'll be cheering you on from, from, somewhat cold or mild Toronto, if you will. Um, but anyway, other than that, thank you for this. And don't forget to like, subscribe, share this episode. And until next time, I bid you adieu. Thanks again. Take care, everyone.